Irving was really quite generous. He said fascination with Botany Pond. I think my wife would argue it's an obsession. Um, this is not Botany Pond. This is the Galapagos Islands. I wish it were Botany Pond. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is this wonderful little gem of biodiversity that sits right in the middle of campus. If you were a student here, you knew it, you loved it, you laid by it, you probably fell into it at least once while you were here. Um, those of you who know me suspect that I'm going to show you a movie clip from a B movie at this point. I'm going to resist, okay? I actually was tempted, but um, instead, let me just make sure that we're all on the same page here, that you are oriented. So you are at the moment, all right, here's, here's the BSLC. This is where you are. Here's Regenstein Library. Here's the main quads. And Botany Pond is this little blue fingernail down here um, by Airman. It's right across from my office, which is right there. My window looks out on Botany Pond. Here's Google Earth vision of what this looks like. This, was, uh, this is actually from 2007, which is why beside Regenstein you don't have a construction site, which you do at the moment. But this is the BSLC. Here's Regenstein. There's my office. And this green thing here is Botany Pond. Why? Why is it green? This is the sort of rhetorical question I ask my students. Um, it's October. I'll show you why it's green in just a second. Looking a little bit closer here, there's Botany Pond. By the way, Google Earth seems to think it's called Lily Pond. I have no idea why. Um, but it's just this little piece of water that's no bigger than, uh, well, it's smaller than this room. Um, it's quite tiny. Here's the plan view, and I really get into Botany Pond, quite literally. Um, this is two years ago um, when we decided it was time to thin out some of the aquatic weeds. I'll have more to say about this in a little while. But Botany Pond, in my view, is the gem of Hull Court. Hull Court is pretty marvelous in and of itself, with the buildings that are there and this archway with the gargoyles. During most of the school year, unfortunately, Botany Pond is kind of wasted. Um, this is what it looks like in mid-December. Um, the pond is completely frozen over. You would think it was completely lifeless. But underneath that ice, there is actually um, a whole group of organisms hibernating, arthropods, turtles, a number of other things. The picture in the winter is stark, but I still find it kind of compelling. This is, again, December of last year. Um, and in, it's beautiful in its own way, but, but I cannot tell you how much I look forward to spring. Um, spring in Botany Pond is really glorious. This is the site of some of our best redbud trees um, on campus. And when they bloom, they go into it very enthusiastically. And the site of the redbuds is generally an indication that soon after, you're going to see life in the pond. Usually the first that you see are red-eared sliders, turtles, um, up here basking. Turtles, of course, are cold-blooded, and in order to get their metabolic rates up high enough, they absorb heat from the sun. And here you see a bunch of turtles trying desperately to get a nice angle to the sun so they can maximize their energy absorption. Um, they really get into this. They are enthusiastic about sunning. It's really wonderful to watch. Um, you've never seen such reptilian bliss in your life. Um, we have a diversity of turtles in Botany Pond. You've got all had handouts. I gave them so that when you go to the pond, you can hopefully do some IDs for yourself. Um, the red-eared slider is the commonest turtle. I'll come back to that in a little while. But we also have interesting native species like the northern map turtle. That's this one here with a sort of grumpy expression. Um, here's a better picture where you can actually see his face. These, these are pretty distinguishable by that very flat face. They're native to the Midwest, um, and they're really quite common. There's also in Botany Pond a false map turtle here. It's this little guy, and this one you can recognize from a distance. The edge of the shell tends to be serrated, and they have a very distinct keel, a ridge on the top. They, too, really get into sunning themselves early in the spring. You can tell this is early. Um, this guy is not happy about having somebody else take his sunlight, um, but they do seem to climb on each other. 
Um, and there's a couple of these in here, which is actually really interesting because this is a species that nominally lives in fairly fast moving water, rivers and streams. So the fact that we get this in the pond at all is quite unusual. Um, and it does seem to thrive. So here's a juvenile. Um, the juveniles spend so much time sunning themselves that they often acquire this wonderful coat of algae on their back, but despite it, you can still recognize it from its really grumpy expression and this very distinct ridge. Um, the th a third species, one that I am really in love with, so much in love with that at one point I served as spokesman for the committee of the college council and I included the first appearance of this turtle, this, this um, spiny soft shell turtle on campus in my spokesman's report because I thought it was a thing to celebrate. It was really wonderful. And, and this turtle is really unusual. It was clearly put into the pond by somebody. We have no idea who. Um, it's been in the pond since, I believe, 2004. Um, when it first showed up, it had a piece of fishing line coming out of its mouth. Clearly, somebody had caught it on a hook, and they released it in the pond. Since then, the hook has dissolved, the line's gone away, and this turtle, every year, I hold my breath waiting for it to come back, and it does, and it's really spectacular. They're a very specialized group of turtles. Um, they have this very long snout. They're very olfactory. They mostly eat small fish and invertebrates. Um, a lot of people worry about the ducklings with respect to this turtle, but I've never seen them bother the ducklings at all. Indeed, I will show you a counterexample where the ducklings bother the turtle in a little while. Um, but this turtle has real personality. It's a little shy. It's actually one of the shyest turtles in there. So if you see it by the pond, move slowly, because um, otherwise it will dive and you won't see it again. Um, they tend to hide among the lily pads. Here's one in, in the middle of the summer when the pond is really spectacular, um, doing its best to, I don't know, look like a lily pad, I guess. Speaking of lily pads, let me take a brief digression into the flora of the pond. <clears throat> We've had a very cold spring, and I wasn't sure that you folks were going to have anything to look at other than the turtles and the ducklings. But just this week, we've had our first of these white, fragrant water lilies come out. This is a Nymphaea odorata. Um, they do actually have a very distinctive odor. You will see lots of insects visiting them to pollinate. Um, here's a, a, a small bee that's in there. Actually, much more commonly, you will see beetles in there. The, um, lots of the water lilies are beetle pollinated. And water lilies are a really interesting group. It turns out that they are the second oldest group of flowering plants on the planet. Um, they've been around since the early Cretaceous. So they shared the planet with dinosaurs for 100 million years. The dinosaurs went away, the water lilies persisted. And they were beetle pollinated in the Cretaceous and they're still beetle pollinated. The second commonest flowering plant you will see in Botany Pond is this thing called the yellow floating heart. And everybody thinks it's a water lily. It's not a water lily at all. It's actually, its closest relatives are sunflowers. It's an asterid. Um, it's just an aquatic asterid. Um, how it got in Botany Pond, I don't know. It's a gorgeous plant. Um, here are a couple of buds of this thing. Um, but the USD, USDA classifies it as a noxious weed. So don't be tempted to take it home with you. <laughs> Um, because they fill any mass of water they're in completely. To the point where in the late summer, many of the animals have trouble negotiating botany pond because of the density of the, the rhizomes of this plant and, among other things, the other plants. Botany pond is a really productive environment. Um, it's tiny, but it produces a huge amount of biomass sufficiently that every couple of years we have to go in and, like any good gardener, we have to weed the garden. Um, so here's two years ago, I, was, uh, I organized a crew to go in and remove some of the excess plants from Botany Pond. It's now looking really nice, but the, uh, the reeds had, had moved about halfway across the pond. And as you can see, the density of these nymphoides is really very high. That, by the way, is why 
in the Google Earth picture, Botany Pond looked green in October. It was still completely covered by these things, which die back completely every year so the pond is barren and then regrow. Um, I have a certain talent in t telling sort of um, Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn type stories. So, so I managed to get a crew of volunteers to help me in this enterprise. A um, couple of undergraduates who I think after a while started to wonder why they were here. Um, and a number of graduate students. You can see how dense that pond can be. Um, this is the Nymphoides, the white water lily, and here it is so dense that now there isn't room on the pond for the leaves, and they're emergent, and this is one of the reasons that we have to periodically pull them back. Um, we took a lot of material out of this pond. Um, here's a dumpster at the end of our sojourn that is literally filled to the brim with material taken out of the pond, and now you can't tell the difference. Oh, anyway. Enough of my, my efforts to keep the pond open. Back to the turtles. Um, the red-eared sliders are the commonest turtle here, A, because they're really common in the Midwest, and B, because I think everybody who gets a turtle for a pet and then either gets tired of it or moves away drops their turtle in Botany Pond. Um, so I counted as many as 15 red-eared sliders in here. They're very successful in the pond. They do really quite well. They cruise among the landscape, mostly eating small insects, although they're quite willing to eat fish. Um, we had a massive fish kill this year, as I think I mentioned in my handout. Um, and I put another 40 fish in last weekend. Um, I can't find any, so I think between the turtles and the ducks, they've all gone away. Um, but they really are very photogenic animals. And they're very good at, at accommodating themselves to the surroundings that they find themselves imposed in. So at least twice now, these turtles have successfully nested by the pond. Laid eggs, the eggs have hatched out. Here's a little hatchling red-eared slider sunning itself. You often will see this behavior where especially the small ones will sit on lily pads in what's really a very shallow bath and that water, because it doesn't circulate, gets really warm. It's like a little bathtub and they clearly enjoy this a lot. Um, here's another one. This one is really early in the spring. You can tell the early spring photos because the lily pads have sort of an orangish look to them. If you go to Botany Pond now, you'll see many of the pads look like this. Here's one that spent enough time in the water um, in these shallow little bathtubs that it's grown a wonderful garden on its back. Um, some of them, however, some of these red-eared sliders are really smart. You know, you think, oh, they're reptiles. They can't be very smart. At least some of them have figured out that not only can you use lily pads as a nice warm bath, but you can also use them as a solar reflector and hammock. Um, so here's a baby red-eared slider that's found a wonderful lily pad that very nicely reflects the sunlight onto its back. Um, they're very aware of what's going on around them. <laughs> really lovely, lovely animals. Um, other herps, we don't get many herps other than turtles in the pond. So for a couple of years, there were bullfrogs, or there was a bullfrog, let me, let me revise that. There was a bullfrog. And although bullfrogs are really quite common around here, I've seen them up in Washington Park, I've seen them in Jackson Park. Um, this one disappeared a couple of years ago and there's been no replacement that I know of. Um, that may be because other things eat them. I have seen herons at the pond fishing and that may be why we haven't got anymore. In the spring, what's most interesting to me is the arrival of the insects. So this year, for example, we've had a really good year with bees. Here's a typical bumblebee uh, at the gardens that surround the pond. The, the year is sort of bookended by two really spectacular insects. One are these big bumblebees that come in. One of the reasons the bumblebees are the earliest animals that you see at the pond is that, I don't know if you know this, but when bees fly, they're actually warm-blooded. 
they raise the temperature of their bodies to the point where their muscles work more efficiently and can generate more, more um, energy. And bumblebees, because of their size and their really good insulation, that fur that you see over them, um, are good at flying even when the air temperatures are low. Um, at the other end of the summer, though, we get things like this candy striped leafhopper, which I really love. This is on a, a rose, actually. Um, but this is the natural color of these animals. They're tiny, they're only about uh, three-eighths of an inch long, um, but if you really get your nose down into the vegetation, you can find them. Other things that show up, um, here's a white-marked tussock moth larvae um, that for unknown reasons was crawling around in the gardens around there. Um, we get a wide variety of, of insect larvae that live on the plants that surround the pond. Um, and an even more interesting variety that live in the pond, but I'm going to skip those for now. Oh, somehow I put, oh, there, yeah, I have two pictures of that, that's right. Um, other more exciting animals that show up are things like this Chinese praying mantis. Um, these, you'll see a couple of these every year marching along. Um, these are the great tiger predators of this ecosystem, at least on land. Um, I've always thought that if you really wanted to meet an alien, you didn't really need to go anywhere other than your backyard, that, that this is about as alien of a visage as you are ever likely to encounter. But my real love are the dragonflies. Um, this is a green darner, Annex junius. This is always the first dragonfly to show up every year. And the reason is that this is a migratory species. This species flies south in the fall, and in the spring, it returns to northern climates. It can travel, the people have now put radio transmitters on these things, and they travel a couple of hundred kilometers a day. So this is a female, again here, early in the spring, you can tell because of this orangish color on the water lilies, laying her eggs in here, the eggs, will hatch out as little predatory larvae that will live in the pond for between two and three years, depending on the water temperatures, and then hatch out into an adult that looks like this. So for three years of their lives, these are aquatic animals that live underwater with a funny trap, jaw, um, trap mechanism on their jaws that they use to grab fish and other larvae that they eat, and then one day, they crawl out of the water, their back splits open, out comes a dragonfly who instantly knows how to fly away. I'm just astonished at this life history. It really is remarkable. Here's a male and a female. Um, you've probably seen this behavior and you thought, oh, they're doing the nasty. No, they're not, actually. Um, this is a green darners in tandem. In most dragonflies, the... Uh, the male, when, when, they, when the male and the female mate, the male can remove any pre-existing sperm from the female. So the last male to mate with the female is the one who gets to fertilize the eggs. In many of the dragonflies, in order to ensure that it's their sperm that get to fertilize the egg, the male actually physically holds on to the female, has a pair of appendages on its back end. Um, this is simply the male preventing other males from getting access to the female. In dragonflies, mating is entirely at the female's choice um, for pretty obvious reasons. Here's actual mating in a pair of green darners. The female has to actively bend her abdomen up in order for mating to occur. So the male can hold on to her, but he can't actually force her to mate. These are wonderful animals. Um, sometimes we get them in really high concentrations. There we go. Um, so here's uh, three of them festooned on a branch. These are actually all females. I'm not quite sure why. Um, and the numbers vary from year to year. So a couple of years ago, we had a lot of them. Last year was kind of disappointing for reasons that I'll tell you in a, in a little while. Um, I have my fingers crossed that this year will be better. Um, I've been looking at the dragonflies for the last couple of years. Botany Pond is actually one of my field areas. Um, and I must tell you, it's really nice to have a field area that's 20 feet yards from your office where you can go out there in the middle of the day, sit down, and as everyone walks by, you can say, I'm working, I'm working. 
Um, what I've been doing is taking high-speed videos of dragonflies. My original interest was to look at the aerodynamics of flight in dragonflies. In the process of trying to get high-speed videos of unrestrained, unconstrained dragonflies, I saw lots of other interesting stuff. Um, now, what I'm going to show you here is a movie of a high-speed movie. It was filmed at 500 frames a second. I'm slowing it down to 30, so it's slowed down by a factor of 15. What we have here is a male dragonfly. Sorry, it's black and white. Male dragonfly, he's holding onto the female. See his abdomen arched over? Okay. The female is laying eggs. This is another male up here. Notice the female raises her wings. This, this is a common behavior of females when males come by. I think it's a way of trying to fend the males off. They try to basically interfere with them approaching, even though she's already being held on to by another male. So this is what's astonishing about dragonflies, their maneuverability, their ability to fly. This dragonfly flies by, turns 180 degrees in midair, stops his backward momentum, checking the situation out here, Glides in. He grabs the male by the abdomen, lifts him up, and tries to pull him off the female. Now, in real time, what you see is, and it's over. Okay? Um, you don't really see this interaction. So here's the male wiggling as hard as he can, trying to get away from this other male, until he finally breaks the second male's hold on him. There. And you can see, when he finally does break, he also reaches up and tries to push him away. There. And the second male finally decides he's not going to be able to get this guy off after all. So they, they do fight even when the males are holding on to a female. So he finally gives up, like a little helicopter, rises straight up in the air. You can see why the aerodynamics of this might really be interesting. Dragonflies, again, are cold-blooded animals. So they're, they're at their most active when the sun is high, when they can get nice and warm, which means that I have to be out there midday in the sun. It's, it's a tough life, folks, but somebody's got to do it. And watch. He takes one last look before he finally gives up. In addition to this green darner, and I'll show you some more green darners in a little while, um, we get um, some really spectacular dragonflies here. Twelve spot skimmer, this is a male. Um, the female looks pretty much like the male, except it doesn't have the white spots. Um, late in the summer, we get an occasional white-faced meadowhawk. These are scarlet animals with a diamond uh, array along their abdomen. This is why they're called white-faced meadowhawks. You can see the white face here. Um, up until this morning, I was going to move on to a different dragonfly at this point, but I went to the pond and I saw my first damselfly of the year. It's been a cold year. So the other thing that you will see there are eastern forktails. Um, this is a damselfly. Damselflies and dragonflies are very closely related to each other. Um, they are insects that are specialized to be aerial predators. So they fly through the air, they see another insect, they fly up behind it, they grab it in their legs, and then they eat it. Dragonflies will eat it while still flying, damselflies will land. Um, they have, have hyper-developed eyes in order to increase their visual acuity. So you can see damselflies have big eyes. In the dragonflies, the eyes are so large that they completely envelop the head, and all you can see are the eyes. Um, this one, the eastern forktail, is re really easy to tell because of this blue pattern on the tail here. So if you go over to Botany Pond, when the sun's up, it may be too late in the day now, you will see these guys flying around. Um, the females, here's an immature female, um, are often, they start out sort of an orangey color and then they will turn a green, um, but they don't have the nice blue uh, on the tail. The other species you may find there are fragile forktails. Um, 
The way you recognize these is get really close and notice this top bar here has a little teardrop at the end. That's the, the defining characteristic for these guys. This is an animal eating a mosquito. Um, you should be very thankful that damselflies and dragonflies are out there. They eat a huge number of insects. If it weren't for dragonflies and damselflies and bats, we'd all be in very serious trouble. The commonest dragonfly on Botany Pond, although not at the moment, it's still too early, are blue dashers. This is a, a blue dasher. This is a couple of inches long. This is a male. The abdomen is a sort of a powdery blue. Um, let me show you the eyes that I mentioned before. See, the eyes are gigantic in these. Um, and by having, you know, insects have um, individual simple eyes that get together to make a compound eye. And the more units they have, the greater their visual acuity. And so what dragonflies have done is put in more and more and more units so that they have enough visual acuity to actually see a mosquito while they're flying, fly up behind it, grab it, and eat it. Here's mating in blue dashers. Again, it's the female that initiates mating, not the male. The male holds on to her until mating is complete. But in this species, the male doesn't continue to hold on to her. He lets go. And part of the reason is that the female, unlike the um, green darners, the female doesn't need to land in order to deposit her eggs. Indeed, the female deposits her eggs without ever landing on the lily pads or the water. So here's a sequence of pictures showing a female depositing her eggs. like little helicopters, little living helicopters. And if you zoom in on the picture, those white spots, those are her eggs. They will hatch out as tiny little larval dragonfly, nymph dragonflies, um, and turn into nasty little predators. But the big thing in Botany Pond, the thing that always attracts the crowd, when you see this, you know that what's there is this. We, we are fortunate enough that the local ducks seem to think Botany Pond is really a cool place, cool enough that they fight over it. Um, so for a number of years, we had annual broods. Um, last year, we didn't have any ducklings. It's not clear what happened. A male and a female showed up. The female went away in March like they always do. Typically, they find some secluded place on campus. It's been in various sites. It's been by Regenstein. It's been over near Harper. It's been um, over by the B School a couple of times. The female will find a site, lay her eggs, brood without eating just sit on those eggs for about three weeks until they hatch, and then she leads them back to the water. The male will be waiting for her there. You've all read Make, Room for, wait, make Way for Ducklings, right? Okay, it's just like that. Um, except the male usually then flies away and gets into trouble. But, but. So the first, the first that you see of these, they're tiny little animals, and they're there remarkably early in the spring. You'd think they'd freeze to death. Again, from the color of the lily pads, you can see this is early. This is the fourth day after they first showed up in 2007. Um, and they are, they absolutely are captivating. Here's the male and the female uh, that are the parents of those ducklings. Um, 2007 was an exciting year because about a week after these duck, those ducklings showed up, a second brood showed up. And Botany Pond was an exciting place. There were there were fights for territory. Um, the males got driven off pretty quickly. Then the females fought it out. Uh, eventually, this female, who actually only had um, these five um, babies and lost two of them almost immediately, eventually she abandoned her brood too. And so there was this um, very touching little scene of these these abandoned ducklings, at this, uh, they were about three weeks old at the time she disappeared, who managed to raise themselves um, and successfully fledged and flew away. But as I said, we had no ducklings last year, so I'm really pleased that we've got more this year. The presence of these ducklings changed my research in an unexpected way. 
Um, I, as I said, I had been sitting by the pond doing these high-speed videos, and, and I was interested in aerodynamic interactions between the wings of dragonflies. This is one of the things that the literature says is important. Of course, the problem with the dragonfly is, yes, it has four wings, so the hind wings are clearly working in the wake of the front wings, but not only are they aerodynamically interacting, but because they're all on one dragonfly, there are neural connections. And so anything that you see might be due to the aerodynamics or it might be due to the nervous system and you can't tell. And it seemed to me that the perfect way to sort this out was to look at dragonfly wings operating in the wake of dragonfly wings, but with no neural connection. In particular, looking at males and females in tandem on the pond. So here we are again, high speed video. Here's the male, there's the female, and I focused in on these because I want to look for interactions between these wings and those wings through the airflow, okay? What I saw instead was this. Cue the music. These ducklings get protein starved. They really need protein to mature. They, their feathers are pure protein, and so they want to eat anything that they can, and believe me, dragonflies are mostly meat. Um, and late in 2007, any dragonfly that came anywhere near Botany Pond was ripe to be attacked. Um, the attacks, as I will show you, were not always successful, so that that, that could be on the Discovery Channel. I mean, you've seen those, those, you know, where the killer whale goes up on the ice floe and grabs the seal. I think this is just as good. So here's, here's another interaction. Here's the male, the female, and the predator. 500 frames a second, so it slowed down considerably. Now, if that cattail hadn't been there, Oh, wait for it. Wait for the expression on this duckling's face. <laughs> you got it. After that, you know, you start to look at ducklings in a different way than you did before. Indeed, you sort of want to retreat to the, sort of this level. Uh, I don't know who put this in Botany Pond, but I couldn't pass it up. Uh, it was pretty wonderful. So as I said, this year, thank goodness, we have not only ducklings, but we have an exceptionally competent mother who has done a really remarkable job. So this was the 3rd of May, um, the first day in which these ducklings appeared on Botany Pond. This is what they look like, little, little yellow puff balls here. They're swimming around with mom in the background. Um, the interactions were really interesting. These are, these are babies. These, are, these have no experience with the outside world. They, in, they instinctively know how to walk, how to swim, but they don't know anything else about the world. So this was the first day in which they appeared. Here's their mom. Mom's trying to get them to go on to the land so that they can rest and sit under her wings. She actually, for at least the first few weeks, she will, she will, she will cover them with her wings to keep them warm. Um, so she's trying to get them all up on the shore. Watch this animal. Now here's our soft shell turtle. Remember the soft shell turtle? Um, ducklings unfortunately don't know the difference between a mud bank and a soft shell turtle. So this one decides he's going to get on shore by going up the turtle. Well, the feet are going like man and he's not going anywhere because the back of a soft shell turtle is really slippery. Mom checks the situation out and gives a helpful nudge. Isn't that sweet? This mother is so smart. Typically, when the ducklings show up on the pond, they lose about half the brood in the first week. Any animal that produces a dozen offspring, natural selection tells you that most of those babies have to get eaten by somebody. Otherwise, we'd be hip deep in ducklings. Um, so typically, the ducks show up, they lose, you know, they go from 12 down to 6 almost immediately. This mother showed up with 13. Today, she still has 12. 
She only lost one, and she lost it in about the day, either day two or day three. I don't know which. Um, so here they are uh, um, on the fifth, three days later. Here they are on the eighth. You can see that they're starting to grow. They're visibly changing um, their body proportions. They're changing the feathers. Um, they are active learners. So here's mom showing the ducklings how to dive. And they're more than willing to try themselves. Look at them. Here's um, eight days, a little over a week, after they show up on the pond, and they're already, already visibly adolescent. Um, the beak is bigger, the head has changed shape. Um, they've, they know the importance of personal hygiene at this stage. They busily groom themselves at great length. Um, and like all ducks, they know the importance of keeping those feathers waterproof so that they oil them on a regular basis. Here's proud mom. Uh, about two weeks after they first showed up on the pond. And the kids are really well trained. <laughs> um, sometimes they remind me of a school of sharks. They're really a little scary, but they get enthusiastically into things. Um, here's after about three weeks. Still following mom. They're, she keeps them in line. She's quite good. Um, at this point, um, this is now the 29th, so this was um, almost four weeks after they, they showed up on the pond. Um, they're very enthusiastic divers. As I said, they need a lot of calories and they need a lot of protein in order to grow. So um, watch the sequence here as we start out with four ducklings, and then we have three, and then they decide they're gonna do it too. So if you go over to Botany Pond now, um, what you're going to see are ducklings that look like this. This was taken on the 31st. All of my subsequent pictures are still in my camera. Um, but they keep getting bigger and more duckish, and they're now just beginning to produce their primary feathers. The moment they have little teeny wings that don't look good for much of anything, although they flap them enthusiastically. I don't quite understand why that is, but they do. Okay. Botany Pond. I find Botany Pond um, a place of inspiration, and clearly so does much of the population on this campus. In the spring, it can be incredibly beautiful. So here's, here we are with a little duckling heading away. Here's a couple of spare males, hoping for good luck, but they're not going to get it. Um, it's a place you can really get into. Um, yesterday, I was over at the pond, and one of your fellow alums was there, uh, well, male and female, with a, a boy about five and a little girl who was about a year and a half or two years. The little girl thought the ducklings looked like so much fun, she proceeded to take her clothes off to her father's horror. Uh, but we talked her out of jumping into the water. Um, and I think it's a place of sublime beauty. Um, where if you look carefully, you see a huge diversity of animals, a huge diversity of plants, you see vertebrates and invertebrates, and you see images that are really transcendent. I would suggest to you that Botany Pond is wonderful in this regard, but not unique. That somewhere near you, there is a place just as gorgeous and just as diverse. If you get out there and look, you can find it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Sir? I noticed uh, your volunteers uh, cleaning out the area. Uh, do you have a problem with adventurous foreign European weeds? Um, well, these yellow ones are Eurasian. Um, they're, they're not native at all to North America. They were introduced by the horticulture trade. Um, most of the problem we have with foreign weedy things is due to the facility services who keep planting things that are not native to this area. Um, when they did the second half of Hull Court, if you go into Hull, if you walk through Cobgate, on your left is Botany Pond, on the right, 
is a garden that was just put in about a year and a half ago. And that one, we forced them to plant native plants. So that is all native plants. What's around Botany Pond is a mixture of some native plants and a lot of really strange exotics. So yeah, we do have this problem. Um, I had to work really hard to keep them from planting bamboo, which is a really noxious weed that'll take over things badly if you let it. Um, it we, we fight this fight all the time. But like any garden, like any natural situation, if you don't keep on top of it and control it, it will move on in succession. There is this ecological ecological um, um, concept called succession in which you go through a regular series of different kinds of plants. And clearly, if we let Botany Pond alone, if we didn't harvest these things, it would slowly fill in, the reeds would take over, and we'd end up with a completely different, and I think probably less fun, um, location. So I'm, I'm deliberately maintaining it in a state that is not the climax community. Other questions? Yes, sir. A few months ago, I attended a uh, service there where someone's ashes are going to be put in. Is that a good idea? Gee, I didn't even know about that. Um, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, your ashes consist mostly of inorganic minerals, calcium, iron, things like that. Um, it would probably fertilize the pond in that sense. I suppose it's not a bad thing. Um, I don't see any defect in that at all. I prefer that you, you be cremated before you bury yourself in the pond, but, but um, I don't see that as a problem at all. And clearly the pond meant something, meant a lot to whoever the person involved was. So I think it's fine. When did the mouth draw the green That's That's in their second year. So in the first year, the babies all look like females, um, regardless of sex. They all have that sort of brown plumage. Um, they do develop the blue patches, but they don't, the males don't develop the green head until the second year when they become sexually mature. Um, I, I always get asked, if nobody's going to ask me, I'm going to ask myself, I always get asked if it's the same ducks year after year. And the answer is, I don't know. I've been taking pictures of the pond for the, about the past 10 years. And I'm always looking at the pigment patterns on the beak and trying to match them up to see if the baby that was born the year before comes back. And I sometimes can convince myself and then I get skeptical. And so I don't know whether it's the same ducks. <laughs> But it's clear that as a location, this one is particularly good. The only problem with Botany Pond as a place to raise ducklings if you're a duck is the fact that we have feral cats on campus. We have a lot of feral cats on campus. And that's why um, I have convinced facilities that we need to have that little white fence that I know is unesthetic. But it means that if the mom duck brings the babies out to rest on land it, towards dusk, they don't then get attacked by wild cats, which is what I'm worried about. Um, and, and this year, it's clearly worked out very nicely. We haven't lost any of them. Yes? Um, is anything known about the ducks before they come to the pond, or where the ducks and ducklings go when they eat? Or are they taking what they're doing home? Unlike the geese, which seem to have settled in permanently in Chicago, the ducks are still migrating. And presumably, these ducklings, when they leave Botany Pond, Initially, they're not very good flyers. They're just learning how to get their wings. My suspicion is that they move off to um, Blake, Michigan, or one of the local lagoons around the lake, get bigger, um, spend a couple of weeks improving their ability to fly, and then they migrate south uh, and come back. But have, has anyone done systematic banding, for example? No. Um, we do have a couple of ornithologists here, but they don't seem real interested. And to tell you the truth, I'm not sure I want them catching the baby ducklings, because I don't know what might happen. Uh, it's kind of a little pond for a swan. And swans, oh, well, I suppose we could try that. Uh, swans have pretty nasty tempers. And I'm not sure, not sure they'd be compatible with little kids. But, but yeah, it's one way to control it. Um, There's no freshwater equivalent of manatees that would eat this stuff. Um, I think getting getting undergraduates to jump in the lake early in the fall, early in the autumn quarter is is a is a good substitute. Um, 
it works well, and, and we find, I didn't show you, but we find all kinds of interesting things in Botany Pond. So when we did that cleanup, we found, uh, found a snail that I'd actually never seen in the pond. It had been hiding in the reeds. Um, we found a toy gun, we found a couple of shoes, we found a folding chair, we found a limestone block about this big that had been used to keep the gates open that somebody had rolled into the pond. We found a sledgehammer, um, all kinds of good stuff that ends up in the pond at various times. Um, anyway, it's, as I said though, I, mean, I, mean, I think what's most interesting about this is not that Botany Pond is unique, it's that I've been looking at it. Um, with the eyes of a biologist looking for the diversity. And I would lay you odds that there is some little body of water near where you live where you can see the same thing if you just spend the time. Part of it is spending time, learning the rhythms of the place. It changes continuously over the course of the seasons. It changes from dawn to sunset. Um, and when you get familiar with that and become familiar with the players, I think you'll see your local areas are just as rich. Yes? Um, if you have a minute more, I'm just wondering, Monty Pond relative to Washington Park, the Kings and Jackson Park, is that something that you've compared at all? Oh! <laughs> can I? <laughs> Um, I, I, as you can tell, I'm an avid photographer, and, and on the weekends, uh, during the week, I, I typically sort of check Botany Pond out and take a couple of pictures. On the weekends, uh, my three favorite pot, spots are Washington Park, which is due west of us, Jackson Park Lagoon, right behind the Museum of Science and Industry, and over just west of Lakeshore Drive at 47th Street, there's a little triangular piece of land that has been um, plowed under and then replanted with native plants. So it's a little piece of prairie. Um, and, and I tend to do sort of trap lining those three spots. Every, every one of those spots, I see different things. So oh, at 47th Street, for example, we have um, indigo buntings. Have a wonderful population of indigo bunnies. Gorgeous birds, beautiful voice. Um, I've never seen them either at Jackson Park or at Washington Park. At Washington Park, I very commonly see green herons and great blue herons. Um, this past weekend, I saw three Baltimore Orioles there, um, right at eye level. It's really astonishing. There are um, Caspian terns will commonly go to the lake the lagoon at Washington Park and fish for fish. I have a wonderful sequence of a Caspian tern flying up with a, a little perch in its mouth and it gets about 50 feet up in the air and the perch gives a big kick and it starts tumbling through the air. So I have this picture of tern fish. <laughs> fish has 50 feet to go before it gets back into the water. Um, so I've never seen a Caspian tern turn on Botany Pond. You wouldn't expect to. What I have seen there are black crowned night herons, um, especially early in the day. If you get on campus early, you will see them right by the pond. Um, it used to be that they would take the goldfish out of the pond. Um, I don't think they bother the ducklings, but they would certainly eat frogs if they found them. Seven. Seven. You have to get there early. Um, each one of these spots has, has overlapping but different fauna. So for example, in the dragonflies, I've never seen um, an eastern pond hawk at Botany Pond. These are wonderful dragonflies, about this big. The males are a brilliant blue. Um, the females are green with a black and white abdomen. And they're very common both in Jackson Park and in Washington Park, but they don't like Botany Pond. I don't know why. So each one of these has its own interesting subset of the total fauna. And that's why I go to all three places. Yes. Will you attempt to maintain uh, the koi or goldfish in Botany Pond, do you think? Or do you um, work it? So that, you know, it's pretty chancy every winter. No, it's not every winter. The, the, the koi actually survived in the pond for seven or eight years. Um, with very few mortalities. Typically, in a typical year, what would happen in the spring is we would get a partial thaw, the top of the ice would melt, and there would be an, a hole um, that connected that water that was on top of the ice to the main body of water that's underneath. Normally in Botany Pond all winter, there's a trickle of water that flows through. There's a water outlet by airmen 
that lets a little bit of water in so it doesn't freeze solid. Um, and when we would get these partial thaws, the dumb koi would swim up through the hole, swim over the ice, and then when the weather would get cold again, they couldn't get back down, and they would get frozen into the ice. It was really pathetic. Um, and so we would lose five or six every year. This year, we don't know why, but early in March, when the pond thawed, all of the koi were dead. Um, well, not quite all. There were a couple of hundred dead fish. There were a few fish left alive. When the ducklings showed up, they ate them. Um, I actually saw one of the ducklings swimming across the pond with a fish tail sticking out of its mouth, being chased by six of his brothers and sisters who wanted a piece. Um, so last weekend, I put in 20 goldfish and 20 minnows. On Tuesday, I saw three goldfish. I'm not sure there are any left. I, we're just going to keep dumping fish in until we can get a population going again. I like the goldfish. I think they, well, for one thing, <laughs> that pond needs fish in it so we don't get mosquito larvae. Um, we need something that will pick the larvae off the top. And then goldfish are also good at scraping algae and eating some of the plants. They won't eat the the water lilies, but they'll keep growth down. And so I've talked to the facilities people. They're happy to keep buying goldfish, and we'll put them in until we get a population going. And my suspicion is they'll be fine. We don't know what happened last winter, but I, this is my personal suspicion, is I suspect somebody accidentally turned off that flow so that it went an completely anaerobic underneath the ice and the fish died. Doesn't affect the turtles because the turtles all winter, they go down into the mud, bury themselves, and they go anaerobic and they stay anaerobic. They don't breathe for three months. Um, they wait for the ice to disappear before they come up again. But that change in water chemistry would not have affected them. Where Sir? Where do you get your water from? The water? It's, the good, it's good old Chicago city water. And it's nothing special. <laughs> It, it's just coming from a pipe in the basement of Airmond. It, it's, it's like I said, it's a trickle. It flows through, and then the outflow is over by the big ginkgo tree. You'll see a U-shaped pipe. That's the overflow, and that keeps the water level constant. And it's just a trickle, so the fact that it's chlorinated doesn't make any difference. It mixes, and the chlorine dissipates. Sir? You're talking about turtles stunning stuff. Mm -hmm. Do they absorb uh, energy or something through their shell? Um, they do two things. One is they simply absorb heat. So the sunlight hitting their dark shell warms them up. The blood that circulates underneath and through that shell. The shell is, the shell is um, modified scales overlying bone. Um, so the, the carapace of a turtle are actually modified ribs. It's a fascinating story. Turtles have modified their development so the rib cage develops outside the shoulder blades instead of inside, as in all other vertebrates. Um, but that bone has a blood supply. So when the shell itself warms up, that warms the blood, and it warms the entire turtle. When they eat, for example, it means they can digest their food much more rapidly if they're warmer. And that's one of the reasons they want to do this. It means they are better able to catch food if they're warmer because they're faster. Um, the other thing they get from this, though, is they do get vitamin D, and they do manufacture vitamins in the same way that you manufacture vitamin D when you're out in the sunshine. So they both get heat and they get ultraviolet they use as an energy source to produce some vitamins. And I've now exhausted my knowledge of turtle biochemistry. Certainly, water is not endangered. It doesn't become invasive. Uh, it's not this particular one wants to take over the entire pond. Um, and it's, and oh man, let me tell you, I thought, oh, we'll go into the pond and we'll pull up the water lilies. Well, the nymphoides, the little yellow ones are really easy. You can grab handfuls and pull them up by the roots. These white ones produce rhizomes in the mud that are as thick as my forearm and they ramify. So we were taking shovels and prying these things out of the mud. Um, it was incredible amount of work. I'm gonna get a block and tackle the next time we do this. Um, after we finished that, I convinced facilities to buy Nufar. Nufar is one of the species that I put on that little sheet. There are two Nufar water lilies in Botany Pond. They're still alive, but they aren't blooming yet, so you're not, probably not going to notice them. But I, I, I forced them to do that because Nufar is an endemic 
to the Midwest. It is a, a, a very ancient group of the water lilies, but it is found only in the Midwest, and I thought we needed some native plants in there too. Um, I don't know who would win in the competition, but I'm going to make sure that that new far survives. Yes? Can we, uh, what kind of uh, things actually live in the bottom? Um, it's a curious subset of what you typically find in aquatic environments here. So, for example, there, with the exception of one really giant snail that we found in Botany Pond, there are no snails in Botany Pond. And I suspect the reason is the turtles, that every time a snail gets in there, it gets eaten with about, within about 15 minutes and never gets to reproduce. Um, <laughs> There is a great diversity of insects so that um, later in the summer, if you look among the water lilies, you can see the dragonfly larvae crawling around. You will see um, little planktonic, um, what are called clodocerans, water fleas. In the mud itself, there are um, aquatic earthworms, the equivalent of earthworms. They're tiny, um, but they burrow into the mud and they mine the mud for organic material, much like an earthworm on land does. Um, and there are insect larvae called coronamids. They're sometimes also called redworms, um, which the adult looks like a mosquito. It's actually it's a midge, um, but it doesn't bite anything. And, and they, they're all adapted for burrowing into this substrate that is anaerobic and very high in hydrogen sulfide. So it, it, it poisons most animals, but they biochemically adapted to it. Or they modify their environment. So one of the things the aquatic oligochaetes do is they make a burrow, they stick their tail out in the water, and they wave it back and forth, and they have hemoglobin, just like we do. So they take the oxygen out of the water, their blood supply carries it throughout the body, and in the process of, of supplying oxygen to their body, the oxygen diffuses out of their body and they oxygenate the walls of their burrow. So if you take a piece of mud and you slice it, you can see each one of these burrows with a, a pale halo around it where all the organic matter has been oxidized and there's no hydrogen sulfide. Um, it, it too is really rich. Um, God, if I'd known you were going to ask this question, I could have shown you pictures, but I don't have them ready. So anyway, there, there's, this is true of almost any natural aquatic environment. The, the animals that live in that mud are really interesting. And it's kind of like a seed bank. You know, if you have, um, if you have an area that has been undisturbed and you turn the soil over, um, you will suddenly discover plants growing. These are seeds that got buried in the soil, but buried so deep that they, they weren't there was no sunlight available, and they simply did not sprout. Um, and it is known that, depending on the species, these seeds can last anywhere from 10 to 50 years sitting in the soil. The same thing is true of this mud. So Matt here will tell you, because he was in my class, um, that we actually took some mud from Jackson Park Lagoon, brought it into the lab. I was going to do an exercise with it, which was sort of a flop. But we kept the mud. And over the next two years, two years, we kept seeing new things appear out of this mud. These worms, these oligochaetes, some algae that hadn't been in there that had clearly sprouted. It's, it's really fascinating how there's, there's sort of this, this short time frame group of animals that reproduce like mad, and then these things that are willing to wait for the exceptional event, something that disturbs the mud, something that overturns the environment, and then they jump in and go. Yes, Maureen. It's not common that there are a few history like originally there, or is it Bonnie Pond originally was just a little swampy place on campus. And if you look at some of the old pictures from campus, you will see Botany Pond completely ringed with cattails. Um, it was simply a wet, swampy place on campus. Um, the problem is that, that all of that water tended to leak into um, the Airman basement. And so back in the 1970s, I believe, um, they excavated the pond and they put in a concrete liner. 
some smart guy decided he didn't like the pond as it was, and so they put in concrete dividers so they could have sort of little cascading waterfalls, which they thought would be really good, but it turned out it didn't work at all. Um, so if you look in Botany Pond, you'll see these white strips of concrete that run across it. They tried to break the dividers out, but they're, they're about that thick, so they didn't break them all the way back, and they're still in there. And when I go in and pull plants, I find them with my toes. <coughs> Once actually went flat on my face, tripping over one. Um, about eight or nine years ago, that liner started to leak, and they had to do this again. Only at this point, we told them that no, they couldn't just take the mud out and throw it away because the water lily rhizomes were living in the mud, as were lots of other things. Um, so we forced, this is so satisfying, we forced facilities to excavate the mud, put it on big plastic sheets, redo the liner of the pond and then put the mud back. Um, and it really, it worked really well.